Hi, my name is Kristen. It's my pleasure to present to you today part of my master's research on tracking purple martins to understand juvenile dispersal and adult foraging behavior with a focus on the northeastern part of their range. This project was for my master's thesis, which I did at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, where I was supervised by doctors Kyle Elliott and Kevin Fraser. For anyone who's interested, my thesis is available online for free. You can Google the title or contact me and I can send it to you. Before I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge everyone who made this project possible, from field assistants to Purple Martin landlords to funders and collaborators, including the PMCA. Purple Martins are particularly interesting to study in the northeastern part of their range because that's an area where they're declining particularly strongly and other conservation measures might be needed to preserve the species. And so I've noticed that in Quebec, for example, there are many nest boxes which are provided by Purple Martin landlords, but there are a few Purple Martins that use them. And so it's important to study different points in the Purple Martins annual cycle to be able to pinpoint some of the causes of decline. So the objective of my thesis was to fill in some of the information gaps in the Purple Martin's annual cycle to be able to better understand their decline. And so the first question I wanted to study was breeding success in Quebec relative to other regions to see if the breeding period is the problem. Secondly, I wanted to study juvenile dispersal to fill in some of the knowledge gaps that exist there. And three, I wanted to study adult foraging behavior because that hasn't been widely quantified. This is the Purple Martin's annual cycle, which most of you are probably familiar with. So Purple Martin's breed throughout much of North America, and then after breeding, they form post-breeding roosts and then migrate south to South America, where they spend the winter in these large wintering roosts, and then they migrate back up to North America to breed. The first part of my thesis focuses on the breeding period. So I wanted to compare breeding success in the Northeast to see if it was similar to other regions or not. So in, across North America, purple martins typically lay four to six eggs and fledge three to four young. So in Quebec, because birds are declining generally more strongly than in other parts, I thought that their reproductive success would be lower. So this can manifest itself in two ways. First, through a smaller clutch size or total number of eggs or fewer young fledged. So what I did is in 2019 and 2020, I surveyed three colonies about twice a week during the breeding season and recorded nest contents to be able to estimate breeding success. So we found that breeding success in Quebec was similar to the North American average, both in terms of clutch size and number of fledglings per nest. So it's important to consider that I only have two days of two years of data across three colonies um, compared to the PMCA's data set of 19 years across North America. So breeding success likely isn't the problem, so I wanted to look at other points in the annual cycle to see if we could pinpoint causes of decline. So here's the annual cycle yet again, and so I wanted to focus on the post-fledging period, so the period after birds leave their nests and before they migrate south. So juvenile dispersal is important to study because the annual survival of most birds is generally the lowest in the first year. And in some species, juvenile survival even li limits the population as a whole. So for example, in tree swallows, juvenile survival limits the species. And so this is an important period to study. So we know that purple martins fledge at about 26 to 28 days old. And here I'm defining fledge as the young bird's first flight. And then young birds are fed by their parents for about seven to day, 10 days after fledging. And then they join pre-migratory roosts and eventually migrate south. So I had two main dispersal study questions that I wanted to answer. The first was where do young purple martins roost? So what habitats are they using to spend the night? And the second question is, does the habitat surrounding the colony influence fledging and departure? So I thought that juveniles would 
choose roosting habitats in safe locations. So to me, a wetland is a nice safe habitat. So I thought that young birds might use wetland to roost. And so wetland is safe because it's vegetation and water. And so that protects birds against most land predators. Furthermore, I thought that habitat would influence departure from the colony. So I thought that individuals in colonies by wetland would depart at an older age because they could use the wetlands to roost, but also wetlands are associated with abundant food. And so birds could stay longer. To answer my dispersal questions, I used MODIS radio tracking. So MODIS works by putting a nano tag on a young bird and that tag emits a radio frequency that can be picked up by a stationary or mobile radio receiver. And so MODIS gives you signal strength and direction. And so from that, you can infer a lot of behaviors. And the advantage of MODIS is that it does not require recapture. So we deployed 104 MODIS tags on nestlings, so 30 in Quebec on the top right and 74 in Ontario in collaboration with University of Manitoba. So with that data, we were able to calculate fledge and departure dates. And in Quebec, we supplemented that with handheld tracking to be able to find roost locations. So we did find some interesting things for roost habitat, and we found different things across the three colonies that we were able to track at. So at our rural lakeshore colony, birds had agricultural and lake habitat available to them. And we found that those birds roosted in the nest box. And then after they departed the colony, we weren't able to locate them anymore. And then at our urban lakeshore colony where birds had urban habitat and lake habitat, we also found that birds roosted in their nest box for about a week after fledging. And then after that, we were not able to find them, unfortunately. And then third, at our wetland colony, we found exactly what we expected. Those birds were using the wetland to roost. And so this suggests that wetland is a safe habitat to roost. And maybe if wetland isn't available, birds are using the nest box as a secondary safe habitat. So we did find in terms of the influence of habitat on departure age and fledging, we found that Habitat did influence departure, but not fledge dates. And so our birds fledged at about 27 days old and they were not influenced by habitat. And that could be because fledging is a more biologically constrained period than departure. And so a young bird can only fledge once it's grown all its flight feathers. And so that's a highly constrained period. We did find that departing fledglings did leave at a younger age when colony is near wetland and water. So this is opposite to what we expected. And so this could be because birds are in better condition when they're near water. And so maybe they can move earlier. So wetlands and water can be associated with insects that have aquatic stages. And those insects are more nutritious. They have more omega-3 fatty acids. And so fledglings could depart at a younger age because they're in better condition. And to me, this suggests that habitat quality is important for young birds. And furthermore, we could measure, in the future, we could measure body condition. And so this leads me to my next question, which habitats are best for foraging? So this is something that isn't widely known in Purple Martins, even though people have kind of circumstantial evidence. So we're back to our annual cycle once again. So I studied foraging during two periods of the annual cycle, the chick rearing period and the overwintering period. So I wanted to see what were the foraging habitats of Purple Martins. So which habitats are they selecting? And so for this chapter, I drew on the concept of habitat selection, where habitats that are selected are habitats used at a greater proportion than they're available. So in this hypothetical example on the right, we have a bird foraging around the colony or the roost. And in the pink area, the points are very dense and they're used more so than they're available. So we say that that habitat is selected. And so because purple martins are often associated with water, as we saw in our juvenile dispersal chapter, I thought that purple martins should select water and wetland habitats for foraging. 
So to answer this question, I deployed GPSs on adults and had some tracks from collaborators in Pennsylvania, Texas, and Florida. And so this was in collaboration with the PMCA and others as well. So I had 100 tracks and because it's a GPS, it has a 10 meter location accuracy. And so this allows us to really pinpoint those habitats that they're selecting. And so we were able to calculate habitat selection using publicly available land cover data. So we found that wetland and water were important foraging habitat, um, similar to the juvenile period where wetland and water were important as well. So for chick rearing birds in Quebec, those birds had a lot of different habitats available to them, mainly forest, open water, wetland, urban areas, and agriculture. And so we found that Quebec birds were selecting water's edge or shoreline habitat and actually avoiding wetland edge habitat. In Florida, birds were in areas that were primarily wetland and urban. And we found that Floridian birds were selecting wetland and avoiding the small patches of forest that were in their vicinity. For our non-breeding birds, we have the Amazonian birds where forest and wetland were the two most available land cover types. And we found that birds selected wetland and were avoiding open water. And then lastly, in the dry diagonal, birds had mainly forest, agriculture, and grassland available to them. And they selected the small amount of open water that was available to them and avoided urban areas, as well as grassland, shrubland, and agricultural areas. So this solidifies wetland and water as important foraging habitats for purple martins, and they're important across different stages in the annual cycle. So what's really interesting to me is we have a wetland here on the top in Quebec, and we also have habitat in the Amazon. To me, it's really interesting that these habitats look so similar. And so there's still a knowledge gap for migration, so it'd be really interesting to be able to study habitat selection for foraging during migration to be able to confirm if that's true across the annual cycle. So in summary, we found that breeding success in Quebec was comparable to the North American average, of course, with the drawback that I only had two years of data. And we also found that wetland and water were important habitats for purple martins across much of their range. So juveniles roosted in wetland habitat, and they also departed earlier when closer to wetland and water. And in addition, we found that adults use these two habitat types very frequently. So if there's one takeaway, I think from my thesis is that wetland and open water are important habitats for juvenile and adult purple martins and habitat conservation should be done to ensure the survival of purple martins in addition to, of course, the wonderful work that's being done by the PMC and purple martin landlords to provide and manage housing. So with that, thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Well, some of you may have seen uh, Kristen in the back of uh, some of those shots in the Amazon. She was actually had some funding in her grant to go down there as well. Uh, Madeline is asking for the name of your uh, paper in the chat. Your uh, we have one in the works, but how about your uh, your master's thesis? Is that publicly yeah. available? Yeah, that's publicly available. I'll put that in there. Yeah, one paper is coming out hopefully soon. The other one's also in the works. Yeah, knock wood, knock wood, uh, very soon, right? Yeah, I hope. Um, okay, other questions in chat. Uh, so, Kristen, you know, the, the thoughts before we started to get all this GPS data uh, was that Purple Martin's spend time around communities in, in Brazil. Why do, why do you think that, uh, uh, you know, your research is showing something different? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I guess I didn't dive too much into it because I tried to cover a lot in a short amount of time. But uh, yeah, I guess for roosting a human dominated environment would be a safe option. And then during the day, they purple martins that are not breeding, they can go pretty far. And so maybe they're going far to go to good foraging habitat, which is not in human dominated landscape. So probably insects are more available um, as we saw in uh, whitewater habitats. 
Got it. Um, okay, other questions questions. Sorry, I guess my camera was off. Sorry about that, folks. I know how you wanted to see my mug again. How might climate change impact wetlands in some regions, Lori asks? Yeah, I think that might depend on the region. So in some areas, um, there'll be drier conditions of climate change. So wetlands might dry up and so there might not be as many insects available. In other places might rain more and there might be more flooding. Um, more um, storms, which also aren't good for purple martins because long periods of rain aren't good for foraging either. So, uh, yeah, on both extremes, probably not great for purple martins. Yeah, so a um, nice comment here from Barbara, and I think it, uh, uh, it goes to the importance of your research. Um, she says, great research presentation, uh, relevant for Purple Martin landlords. Um, so how, how do you, uh, you know, look at your research on foraging ranges um, in the greater scheme of, you know, Purple Martin conservation and, and you know, and uh, determining good places for Purple Martins? Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, Purple Martins tend to forage pretty close to their, um, to their houses because they're feeding their chicks, they can't go too far. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for local habitat conservation. So Purple Martin landlords are of course doing great work cleaning up and maintaining their houses, but that could be paired with local skill efforts to conserve important habitats. And to also just raise awareness about the problems with pesticides and things like that. Um, D. Kirk asks, any data on number of feedings going up or down over the years? That's interesting. Um, you know, number of foraging trips and that sort of thing. What do you think? Yeah, it's really interesting. I don't really have an answer for you. I guess I could theorize and say if insect availability was higher in the past, probably um, they could do shorter trips and more trips and they'd be in better body condition. Um, but uh, I only had a short period of data, so I couldn't really tell you that. Yeah, there's really not the long the long term data in, intact uh, or uh, available for the, for that kind of an answer yet. Well, hopefully, uh, Kristen, your your research is the first part of uh, a long term study on that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, thank you so good. much. Uh, if there are any other questions that pop up, uh, feel free to uh, answer them in chat. And thank you so much for being a part of the conference, Kristen. Yeah, thanks, Joe. I'm happy to answer any questions.